So this is a post lunch session, as uh, as we know, and uh, post lunch session is always challenging. Uh, but I think the organizers of this conference have faith in me uh, that I'll make it interesting enough for all of you to remain awake. So <laughs> I'll do my best there. Um, just to introduce myself, I'm Sunil Mundra. Um, I work with Hotbox Technologies uh, as as part of the consulting team there, and I work with organizations in their journey towards agile adoption and transformation. So this presentation is essentially my learnings, not only from uh, Hotworks, who are known to be pioneering uh, the agile adoption and transformation work that they have done in the past and continue to do, but also my work with other organizations who are on that journey. So how many of you have uh, seen the video presentation by uh, Linda Rising for the Agile Mindset? Uh, so, actually, it is believed that she has invented this term called the Agile Mindset, and in her presentation, she contrasts it with something called as a fixed mindset. And she makes a point that this is the kind of mindset which you need in order to really drive uh, all, the, all the benefits of Agile. So, uh, Let's, let's look at what this is all about. This is the agenda broadly. We're going to look at what is the agile mindset. We'll look at how do we observe whether this mindset exists or not, because mindset is something which is intangible. And as leaders, as coaches, as mentors, as managers, how do we know if this mindset exists within our organization? The next question is, how do we keep enabling this mindset, or how do we embark the journey for enabling the agile mindset? And finally, if you have some time, we'll do some QA. All right, so let's look at what is the agile mindset. So today, everybody is, uh, you know, as we know, following agile, uh, some because they are forced to change. Business circumstances are such, competition is such that. Your customers are asking uh, organizations to become agile. Product companies want to get products fast to the market, so they are following agile. Some are anticipating change, and therefore they are trying to implement agile. And some, because, and there are some organizations which I have come across where they are doing it just because everybody else is doing it, and some very senior believes that this is going to work for the organization. So, people are saying we are doing. All processes right? related to agile because we believe that yes, uh, processes will deliver the benefits. People are saying that we are doing all practices, all processes. But the question to ask is are we getting all the intended benefits? So, while processes and practices will give you benefits. Two benefits of agility, right? The impact which needs to happen at the business level, right? At the organization level. Is that really being achieved? That's that's the bigger question to ask. And the answer that most organizations are given <coughs> is an emphatic no. Right? So while you get some benefits with respect to visibility, transparency, and and, and early feedback and things like that, you're really not getting those benefits at a scale. Leaders are asking this question, why? What's, what's, what's really missing, right? If, if uh, we are doing all the processes and practices, we're doing standards, we're doing retrospectives, we're doing things slicing, we're doing user stories. Where is the gap of the problem? And the question is really, how do we introspect on what's missing? And that missing element is the agile concept. So, Here's the definition of the Agile Mindset, which I picked up from Wikipedia. It's a definition of the mindset. We already know what Agile is, so I'm not going to talk about that. But it, it, it says it's a set of assumptions, methods, and rotations held by one or more people or groups of people. It's so established that it creates powerful incentive within these people or groups to continue to adopt or accept prior behaviors to us. So if you look at Venkat's 
uh, presentation today morning. This is a complex definition, right? I don't know why it's made so complex, <laughs> right? Uh, but if I have understood this correctly and if I can explain it in my own words in a simple way, I would say it's a set of values. It's a, it's a culture, right? which, which, which definitely is within people uh, and, and in their minds and in their hearts, right? So that's, that's how I would describe mindset in, in, in simple terms. So let's look at some of the characteristics which indicate that have a mindset. And obviously the converse is true that if you see that this characteristic is perhaps missing, you may want to actually check the, um, the maturity of the organization culture with respect to uh, agile transformation. First, and to me this is a very important uh, indicator of the agile mindset is to look at failure as a learning opportunity. How do we traditionally respond to failure? Grab on the knuckles, right? Punishment, you've done something wrong. And that's from perhaps the seniors to, you know, the people below the hierarchy. And within the same level of the hierarchy, it's about blame game and finger pointing. What does it mean to create? And what is one of the tenets of agility? Fail fast. Because if something is not going to work, and if you're going to hide that failure and push it down the line, it's going to hurt you that much more and hurt you exponentially. So, one of the key things which uh, teams and organizations with agile mindset do is look at failure as, an, as, as a learning opportunity. You try something small, it didn't work out. You actually are happy that you know you know that in the early stages it did work out and you have a chance to improve before it is too late. So looking at failure as a learning opportunity, looking at uh, failure where there is no blame game but an opportunity to introspect and learn, I think that is a very uh, important indicator of the agile mindset. The second bit is for people are intrinsically motivated. And I think this issue got addressed a bit during uh, Naresh's presentation when the question was asked about the quality of people. Yes, I think that that is an important consideration that we need good quality people. But I think organization has a responsibility to also ensure that you know people are this, right? So what is intrinsic motivation? So the opposite of intrinsic is extrinsic, right? And if you were to distinguish between intrinsic and extrinsic, it is that extrinsic is about external factors. So you do a job, you're working because you need a salary, right? You need to be seen as working, you need some status, whatever it may be. And I'm not saying that those factors are wrong. And obviously those will be there and you will uh, be motivated for extrinsic reasons and that's all good. But I think it is also important for people to be intrinsically motivated. Intrinsically motivated means I enjoy what I do. I do it because I have a passion for doing something. I do it because I want to make a difference. I do it because I want to make my customers happy. All of those things. And why is this important for agility? Well, agility is all about achieving excellence. And in my view, and this is my personal view, my formula for excellence is skill plus passion. So you may be good at something, but if you are not passionate about it, or if you're passionate about something, but if you're not good at it, then I think excellence cannot be achieved or cannot be, even if it is achieved, it cannot be sustained. So I think it is important that people take pride in what they do, people enjoy what they do, uh, people own up what they do, and therefore, you know, achieve excellence. And I think that is an important characteristic of the AI mindset. Third is teams welcome diversity of thought. So why is really this important? Right? What happens in in a mindset which is not agile? You might have a manager or an architect say, "All right, this is my view, and you're just going to go ahead and execute this." That's just a single person view. What agile believes in is it empowers the team. It believes that the team is the most important unit 
in the entire hierarchy, whatever it is you may have or you should have. So when you have power with the team, you need to give them the power to make decisions, to, to uh, really come up with new ideas and things like that. And the diversity of thought is important because you're believing that every person is an intelligent human being who has a particular perspective regardless of their seniority. So even if you have a pressure joining team, if that pressure is good enough to enter the organization, right, and has come to this team after whatever training that he or she might have gone through, that person is good enough to contribute, right? We are all human beings and we have a brain and we are intelligent. The point here is when you have diversity of thought and when you discuss and debate the pros and cons without getting emotional about those, and based on that you, you choose a, a course of action, you are de-risking things. You are making sure that your decision has considered multiple alternatives and to the best of your knowledge and ability, you are choosing the right one. So your risk, because of varying perspectives that come into the decision making process, you are reducing risk. Second is, diversity of thought will also lead to continuous improvement and innovation. Because if somebody has a different way of doing things and is challenging the way things are done, then that will definitely lead to newer ideas and continuous improvement. And that is why we need to encourage diversity of thought. I think the point is not just about having diversity of thought, but how do you handle it? Okay. How do you, without getting emotional, as I said, debate pros and cons and, 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 and then decide. So it's not about my point not getting accepted, it's about what best for the team and, and how, how will that work. Again, I think this point, the expense of work? No, not really. Right? Work has to be done. Okay. And, and deadlines are there, etc. But I think people need to enjoy being with each other. And I think between team members, and it definitely fosters collaboration. And therefore, it is important that teams, and some of the best practices which I have seen are that teams are encouraged to spend time outside office, you know, on, on get together. So, you have a celebration, you know, periodically you go out for lunch, etc. So people are not only connected with each other within a team, within their formal roles, but they also share a little bit of a little bit of a personal relationship, you know, between between the team members and know about each other. And I think that is really the key to uh, you know better communication and collaboration. And then this is one sim one indicator I would say that that the team is, is having that mindset. Sustainable pace, why is it important in agility? It's because a lot of discipline is required to deliver working software incrementally and iteratively. And you will be able to do that only if you work at a sustainable pace. I'm sure every project goes through challenges where at some points in time you would need to stretch. But if that stress, uh, stretch goes on for an unreasonable period, then something will give it. And that something giving in is ultimately going to hurt you know, the, the project, the product, and the organization. Okay. So that's, that's really why you know, sustainable pace is important. And there are many elements to working at sustainable pace. It's about being transparent with the customer. So for example, you, you land up with a surprise, you underestimated something. It's very important that you go back to the customer and say, yes, we thought it was this. We had made those, like, those kind of assumptions, but now when we are looking at this, it, it's really turned out that. Now the fact of the matter is that that's the reality today. And if you can take the customer into confidence and say, how do we deal with this reality? You could deal with it in a much mature way and with the satisfaction of everyone. You could reprioritize something, reprioritize something, right? There, there could be multiple ways in which you could handle it. The customer might sometimes even say, you know, yeah, it's okay to add, you know, a couple of people you know, if they are especially towards the end of the project, just to get it done on time. So, so there's multiple ways to go about it, but I think one of the key things, or key enablers is to always take, you know, customers into confidence uh, when, when, you, when you encounter a surprise, which can disturb this. Again, we discussed about, Vekat uh, mentioned about being in the comfort zone today morning. 
and that comfort zone again is a problem as Lovenka tried to point it out. And agility is all about embracing change essentially. But if the team's mindset is to be in the comfort zone and if that's the case then you may do all practices and processes but you will not get to the, the real benefits of agility. So embracing change is all about looking at newer ideas, embracing change is all about uh, working with the customer to see how best to <coughs> do the change which is coming from the customer. And it's, it's about collaborating between people and with the customer to ensure that we take the best course of action when we are embracing change. This again is an essential characteristic to ensure that things don't get hidden under the carpet and surface as bigger demons later on. And this requires courage, this requires people to feel safe that if they bring out a problem, they will not get hammered for it. So it's, it's about transparency not only within the team members but also to uh, you know, their leaders, their coaches, really bring up issues just so that uh, in, case, in case there is an issue, in case there is a problem, uh, we can tackle it before it becomes a big one. This is an important characteristic to really work well as a team. And I think it has to be inherent, you know, within people that they would want to communicate and collaborate. So for, for example, if I'm stuck with a problem, I can struggle with it for, for, for hours and days, but at the same time I could just go and say, hey, I'm struggling with this, you know, can you just look at it and tell me, you know, give me your perspective on whether I'm heading in the right direction. So communication is the key and that's not only with it, even within the team but even with the customer as well. And obviously it assumes that the customer is available uh, at all times to do the communication or a proxy for the customer is. But it's important that in case you have a doubt, uh, you know, you want to get back to, uh, you know, somebody else to check and, and verify that and move forward uh, and, and, and make sure that you're doing the right thing. And again, collaboration because as Naresh pointed out, it's not about definitive roles, it's not about, you know, working in silos. I mean, you, you're supposed to be, uh, you know, a generalizing specialist, as you mentioned. And to that effect, and to make that work uh, in, in a proper way, I think collaboration between people is going to be key. So if, if, if uh, you know, I'm a business analyst, and if a tester is struggling, right, then I, I may be called upon, or I should, you know, go myself and, and offer help. And that's what collaboration is all about. That's what it's about getting things done on time, uh, you know, with the best effort put by the team. One of the key tenets of agility is continuous improvement. And it's again all about that. And this, this requires a team to be mature enough to always look at the status quo. And observe not only what's going well, but how can we improve further. And that again is a sign of a mature team in terms of the mindset, where they are themselves able to observe and challenge and question whether things are, are being done the right way. And e even if so, can they be improved further? So looking at anti-patterns by themselves, yes, initially when you embark on the journey, perhaps, you know, the, the coach uh, might, might do this, but as the team becomes mature in their mindset, they will be able to start doing this. I have seen this in many organizations that people use knowledge as a source of power. I will only share what is really necessary for somebody to know and not beyond that. And I derive a power from that. I think that's a clear anti-pattern, right? 
here it's not about driving power or anything like that. It's about <laughs> making the customer happy. It's about doing your work uh, where excellence is achieved. And it's about the team. It's not about the individual. And for that to happen, people need to be sharing knowledge willingly. Uh, you can't force, force people there. You can certainly have documents, etc., etc. But once the willingness comes in to share knowledge, it just becomes far more effective. All right. So those are some of the things which uh, which we looked at as as key characteristics, and I'm sure there are many more. Uh, and, and if we have time, you know, uh, some of you can share your experience as well in terms of what are some of the good things that you see with respect to, you know, the culture of change, which I might have missed out. But let's look at, you know, what can leaders, coaches, <coughs> managers, etc., do uh, to enable this mindset to happen. So it's a, it's a well-established fact that cultural change, and as we said, mindset is a, is a cultural thing. Culture change to happen. Uh, and to sustain, it's the leaders who need to take first steps, right? Of course, people on the ground have to be, you know, willing and receptive to do that. But I think putting the enablers in place for the cultural change is the responsibility of, you know, the leaders. Okay? So I would say that, you know, leaders have to take the onus and the initiative to really, you know, enable this to happen. This is what I was mentioning, that you yourself demonstrate cultural change. So not only put enablers there, but walk the talk, right? You're, you're asking your people to do something, but you behave contrary. Not going to work. Right? Demonstration by example is the best way to, to make that happen. Secondly, create, when you do it, you create work, uh, yourself as a whole model where people can say that if that person can do it, then definitely I do it. And it then, then starts populating talk. So you need to do, start demonstrating culture at the top, cultural change at the top. How do you do that? Transparency. Especially about challenges. So if we are facing challenges at an organization level, for example, where something is hurting us as an organization, perhaps our existence is threatened, perhaps there's a new competition, somebody may think that, oh, why does this developer need to care? Or that person needs to lose common code. No, not really. If that message has to be ingrained in terms of making that cultural change, then this is very important, right? It is really to share the reasons why we need to undergo this cultural change. One of my learnings has been that change is very painful for human beings. And even when we know that change is good for us, it's hard. And one of the things that helps to be able to make that change happen in a less painful way is to create that appetite for change. So I'd like to give the analogy of food, right? If you're full or you don't feel like eating something and you try to push something down your throat, what will happen? You'll just throw it out. That's exactly what happens with change when it is pushed from top down without creating the appetite. So leaders have to focus on how they can create that appetite for change. And sharing that big picture, sharing those challenges, right, being transparent about things at the top, definitely creates an appetite for change. We again talked about this earlier. Are people machines, right? Are people just resources? Are people faceless characters? No. People are people, and people expected to be treated as people. So, and, and that has so many connotations to it, right? So, if, if somebody is having a personal problem, how do you sort of empathize with that situation? How do you say that, all right, yes, please attend to that problem first, we'll look at working. Right? How do you give that message? And that person, if you are so empathetic with it, that person actually will go back resolve that issue, whatever he or she will be facing, and come back and perhaps work twice, twice harder, whatever it may be to get things done. So it's very important that we treat people as people to, again, make them intrinsically motivated. Otherwise, if you treat people as resources, 
Mars machines, they will never get it. I'm sure one of you have learned this talk, right? Servant leadership. So the role of a leader actually changes from being directive right, and command and control, being a servant leader. And I think this is uh, one of the things which I've found very difficult for leaders to do, is to get into this mode, where you say that it's not me who's the most powerful in the hierarchy, but it's the team which is the most powerful in the hierarchy. And how do I ensure that I am there to help the team, I am there to remove all the impediments, I am there to do whatever that the team wants me to do to help them achieve excellence, go faster, etc. And I think leaders need to start demonstrating this in order to move towards that mature culture. The second bit is around redefining success criteria. So, what do we measure as success? It's, it's important. In a traditional mindset, task completion largely is a measure of success, right? For a person, for a group, for a block, whatever. In a child, we are moving towards value, right? So, task completion is not as important. Of course, it is important, but the whole goal is that we move towards value creation. And that is what needs to become your success criteria, the ultimate success criteria, and not task completion. And how do you again get there towards that mindset of looking at value is you need to ask for the right information. So I'll give my favorite example, and I think again that what uh, discussed a bit earlier, is in many, many organizations, we see that the testers' performance is measured by the number of bugs or effects that they find. I think we need to question whether that's the right information that we need to look at. As Naresh mentioned, it's a zero-sum game. Right? So, who's, who's a a better tester, somebody who collaborates with the, the developer to ensure that there are no defects in the first place, or somebody who says, when the developer goes to him and says, hey, can you just have a look at it, right, it's still on my machine and just give me uh, your initial feedback, rather than doing that, the tester is thinking in his mind, why should I do that, right, let the developer check it for and so that I can find maximum bugs. Where are we getting? So I think it's really important to examine the goal of metrics that we use to, to look at success criteria. And that's why uh, this, the set of metrics which are used in Agile are, are quite different from uh, the traditional methods. And this is one area where I found that leadership, if they don't act uh, swiftly enough, so you have all these practices and processes in place, but you still measure people by task completion, by an MPP progress, by percentage completion, etc. Sorry, you're not going to get, you're not going to get results. This is another difficult one. Management always wants, or leaders always want, a single neck to catch if something goes wrong. Right? So again, it's about change in culture where you say, yep, success or lack of it is at the team level. So while individuals within that team will be accountable for what they do, but it is not the it is not the person or the manager or sales <coughs> who are judging that. It is the team that should judge that. But the overall success which is being seen from a different level, that should be looked at it from a team's perspective and not an individual's perspective. So individual heroism. Uh, you know, is, is something which if it comes from somebody else from outside the team, again that is a zero sum game because if you glorify somebody, right, the others will feel less glorified and therefore it becomes a zero sum game. So you need to be careful about the way you look at a team and inculcating that team level accountability. The third bit is about continuous improvement. I 
think this is one of those tenets of agility which does not get as much limelight and importance as it deserves. But I think it is a really a key towards moving towards that right mindset. How do we do this? Key is establish a system of regular feedback. Because if you know that something is not working well, you have room to And I think early feedback is important. And there is an art, and this is within the team, and of course early feedback from the customer is important, but I'm saying even within the team, even within the organization, if something is not working well, then that feedback needs to be given in a way in which it is not about fault finding, but it is about how can things improve. And there is an art of giving as well as receiving constructive feedback. And I think managers, leaders have to ensure that those practices about giving and receiving feedback come into the organization. So for example, if one of the team members is not performing well, how do you let that person know, right? So you really need to understand what the problem is. Is it the intent? Is it the capability? Is it lack of training? What is it, right? But and sometimes people don't even know that they are doing something wrong or can do better unless somebody comes and tells them that, right? We can't wait for year-end performance appraisal to you know give people feedback. It's just too late. It's just too late. so we need to look at how we can put in systems for you know giving and receiving early feedback. Disruption in general has a very negative connotation. Right? Disruption means oh there is a problem. Right? Everything has to go. Through. Unless you look at innovations, right? <coughs> innovations don't happen unless there is a disruption. Okay, you try, you fail, you do something, right? So, how can you encourage disruptions which are positive? In right? How can you encourage trying something out, see if that works, try it out in a way where you try it out on a smaller area and then you can propagate to a larger scale. Right? And disruption means again a change, right? So, and that's why I think. A lot of people resist it because a new way of doing things always means a change and as I said, people are generally resistant to change. You need to encourage that. And I think that is what leads to better practices and continuous improvement as well. So we talked about failure earlier, but I think it is important for the management to give that message that it's okay to fail fast. I think it's easier said than done. Okay. So while teams can start looking at this as, a, as failure as a learning opportunity, and the management as well, and the leaders as well, but I think if you actually say that it's alright to fail, try this at a small scale, right? What if you've done something with a good intent, right? With an intent of improving something and it's not, it's not worked out. It's okay. And it's okay to fail fast, and it's okay to learn from it. Very important for the leaders to demonstrate. Many people think that agility is all about the development process and the development team itself that can you can keep attributed to that. Not really. If you again want to achieve true transformation, then it has implications for the entire organization. And unless you make those changes at the organization level, right? You will have impediments along the way and you will be constrained as to how much agility you can achieve. So what can we do? This is a very contentious statement, but this is my personal view, right? I'm qualifying that. So let's understand what CMMI is all about, right? What is the objective of CMMI? CMMI believes that a project needs to be successful and a customer needs to be happy and we are all aiming towards that. I think agility also aims towards that. So with respect to the goals of CMMI and Agile, I don't think the outcomes expected are any different from, from both of those. Where I have a problem with CMMI is that it says regardless of the context, you have to follow this process. And Ajay says, you are the team, here's a guideline, you decide what is the best course of action for that situation. To me, 
these parts are not meeting right now at least. I'm sure there are thought leaders who are doing research on this and saying what level of agility maps to what level of CMMI. But I don't think the final word on this has, has come out yet. And at least I am not convinced. I know many organizations use CMMI level as a marketing tool. But which is a better tool? A happy customer whom you can provide as a reference or CMMI certification. I think referenceable customers who, who speak very well about you do a much better job as a marketing enabler rather than some CMMI certification. I know that we are still uh, in, in, in a situation where many government organizations etc. ask for, for the certification. But I'm very hopeful that those things will change. A lot of teams today are working in a distributed way, right? We have one shore, offshore, we have multi locations within, you know, uh, not only within the same city, but if you're sitting on different floors, right, there is a barrier to communication and collaboration. And I think we need to invest, management needs to invest. People treat that as an expense, right? But it's actually an investment. I mean, I have worked with clients where the quality of, you know, the phones where the conference calls are done is so terrible. How, how will you enable that? Why will people get encouraged to communicate and collaborate if, 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 if that's the case? I have seen situations where STD calls can only be made from the manager's room. Right. How will that work? I have seen situations where, you know, we use a lot of stickies and agile to put up visual indicators and things like that. There are organizations where if you want a packet of sticky, you have to put a requisition, it will go to the purchase department, that purchase department will try and find out where to find it cheapest, that vendor will deliver, it will go to the stores, and finally it will come to the team. It takes 8 to 15 days to get just a packet of sticky. How will that help collaboration? <coughs> so I think you need to look at, you know, policies which hinder collaboration, remove those, and Look at things which will enable this. Right? Otherwise, it's going to be hard. You are a trust me, right? I think the problem that I have seen in many organizations, if somebody makes an exception, that is assumed that everybody is going to break that rule that way and a policing policy comes in for that. Even for a small exception, the entire organization has to bear with that policy. So I think we need to look at areas where we can remove unnecessary policing. For example, I talk of hot box. We do not monitor people in and out time. Why? Because everybody in the team knows where that person is. It is assumed that you would be doing, you would be coming into office on time, you are responsible enough, right? To be coming on time to office and, and doing the work. If you are not, you will get feedback. And somebody will check with you, is there a problem, right? Why are you not coming on time? What's happening? There are ways in which you can do this. Yes, there is also an issue of how scalable that is, how you can do that, but I'm sure there are ways you can do that by, you know, having smaller teams around. But I think it's important to have policies where you show trusted people, right? I think that goes a long way in, in, in you know, uh, people having the right mindset. I'm sorry to say, but I've found that this group of middle management gets most threatened, you know, when we go on an agile adoption transformation chair. The middle managers, right? And I'm not saying that their insecurities are unjustified. They really are, because their role needs to change. Frankly speaking, there, are, there is no, no role of a quote-unquote manager in an agile team. So, <coughs> yes, you might still have a project manager there. But clearly the role shifts from being a manager to being a facilitator and a servant leader. And if you are empowering the team, the manager can be left to ask himself or herself, what's my role? Am I going to lose my job? Right. So I think we need to address those insecurities. 
How do we do that? You need to bring those out in the open, right? Leaders need to have conversations with that group which might be feeling insecure to say, are they all right? What are, the, what are their concerns? What do they have? And unless you bring it out in the open, right, you're not going to be able to address that. So it's important that people discuss it out, recognize that these insecurities are there, and let people talk about it. I think people need education on what does it mean in a change role scenario, right? So it's, it's about reassuring them that it's not about, you know, you sort of directing people, but how you can do more value-added stuff as a facilitator and as a change agent. So what are the benefits of the change role for a manager, right? Those need to be highlighted. What are the options for them, you know, in terms of leadership roles? Those need to be highlighted. And there are many, many leadership roles available or uh, that exist in agile organizations. It's not that it's just all about the team and there is nobody at the top. There is, the hierarchy is definitely flatter, but there are definitely leadership positions which are which, which are created and which are there. So I think, again, uh, what works again well is role models. Okay? And if there are some people who are early adopters and have you know, made that positive change, it's important for the people who are struggling to have those shadow you know, these people who are, you know, who have made that change. And I think once they see role model at the peer level, I think that then definitely helps, you know, addressing those insecurities and making that mind shift change happen better. One thing which I want to say about, uh, uh, you know, this, this particular group is, if you look at the change curve or, or how people are slotted with respect to change, it's a bell-shaped curve where you start with the innovators, the people who have already made up their mind are very excited about that change. There's an early majority who is tending towards that change. There's a late majority who is a little okay with the change, but they're largely skeptical. And then there is this group of laggards, which you know are very skeptical or won't want to change at all for whatever reason, right? And most organizations focus on the first three, leave out the others because they think that's a very small group and they'll fall in line by themselves. My experience has been that those people also need to be addressed in, in the right way. And as Venkat mentioned earlier, you need to try out, change their mindset, put in enablers for them to make the change happen. But there will be some who will just not change regardless of whatever you do. And my personal view is they need to be offered on the bus. Tough call to take, but I think at some point in time, you know, you don't want a stinking apple around which will infect all the other apps, right? So it's very important that, you know, insecurities coming from people, etc., be addressed in the right way and see what is that, what is the root cause of that insecurity and can you address it. That's it from me. I think I have kept done. If you have any questions, I'm happy to take it. In a crisis and they feel that, oh, we have tried everything else. Now we have no option but to follow, you know, the agile way. I don't go that way. Or there's a competition which is pushing you down your throat and you need to go back to the market quickly, whatever, right? Or your survival depends on how quickly you can take your product to the market. So I think creating that appetite is all about sharing that vision of the organization with the people now, right? And giving them that big picture view and making them a part of it and sort of really saying that how they have a role to play in this whole process, right, at whatever level they might be. That's really, I think, the key to creating that appetite to change is being transparent, sharing that big picture view, and saying that we are all in this together, right, and how do we take this forward. You are talking about uh, the team sitting together, working together. Uh, Sorry, can't hear yeah. Sorry, it's not working. Uh, so you're talking about uh, the team are working together. Uh, but how about a project uh, with members across the draw? We have, we say, there are a lot of instances like the team is distributed across a uh, different part of the country or different part of the part of the So how do you think, how to make such a team more effective for a team actually? That's a different topic itself and uh, actually if you go to SlideShare, you will probably see a presentation me on distributed development best practices, right? I have spoken on, uh, on, on, on that. It's a, it's a separate topic which deserves a different mention altogether. 
So, just to give a bit of a context, I think in the early days it was, was treated that distributed way of working and agility don't go hand in hand. But we all know that distributed working is a reality today, right? It is painful, it is not ideal, let's accept that because you know you cannot communicate face to face, team is not in a single location and there are definitely constraints and barriers which come up. But I am very happy and proud to say that ThoughtWorks was one of those organizations which demonstrated that the challenges of distributed development could be overcome to a large extent, I am not saying fully, right? by putting in some processes and practices around that. <coughs> so there's multiple ways of going ahead, right? You need to have uh, you know good tools which will which will which will have a common source of truth and radiate information uniformly across, right? You need to have practices where there is good coordination between the teams. For example, if you have checked in port, right, and, and some other team in a different time zone is going to be working later on on, on the same you know piece of uh, port uh, with a single version control system and you've broken the build and gone. And they can't check in anything, right? That's not a good thing, right? So how do you work around that? How do you cross-pollinate people? So again, a lot of managements are very apprehensive about travel costs, right? But in my view, they pay off in the long run. It's an investment, it's not cost. How do you have people travel from you know, one location to the other to understand the context? That includes the customer as well. To make sure that people connect with each other in person, those trusted relationships are developed so that they can carry it back. And, and um, you know, be as intimately connected as possible despite being far away. So there's a multiple set of measures that you can do with respect to processes, practices, tools, etc. to try to overcome the challenges of distributed development to the best that you can. But yes, uh, as, as I say, distributed way of working is, is definitely not uh, an ideal state of working, but it's a reality today. But that's a bigger topic of discussion. I'm happy to discuss offline with you, uh, you know, whenever we get that. Sunil, yes? This side. Ah, here, here. Uh, yes, yeah, on your left side. Okay. Just have one question. Sure, sure. Uh, Sunil, uh, my question to you uh, is uh, many of the uh, indicators that you show, uh, discussed, mm -hmm. they are very insightful, very, very good. Uh, so what I was thinking is, uh, uh, is there any organization which was not exhibiting these characters which looked to transform into agile world and was able to achieve most of them, if not all. And if yes, what is the kind of timeline they took to achieve uh, the agile mindset that you described? So, very good question. Thank you for asking that. So, first is these indicators are not binary, right? It's not that you have it or you don't have it. You might have it to a certain degree. What is, I think, important is to see where you are at, on those indicators as you are beginning that journey and how are you progressing on those as you move forward, right? There are various maturity levels and it's not that you need to have again all of them, there are many of them, it's a, it's a, it's a multi, I would say it's a multi year journey. And in my experience, I think to achieve true transformation and I can think of a couple of case studies where, uh, you know, ThoughtWorks has done, you know, this kind of consulting and actually transformed the whole organization to that, it's a multi year effort. I think I would say any anywhere between, uh, you know, three to five years is the kind of timeline that we are looking at, uh, you know, to achieve uh, you know, a reasonable level of maturity with respect to those indicators. Yeah, it's a multi-year journey. Transformation is a multi-year journey. I think adoption, yes, you could achieve it, you know, within a few months period of time and adoption is when you are actually limiting it to a team, you are starting with an early adopter team, you are introducing all the processes and practices. No, I think processes and practices are important. It's not that they are not, right? <coughs> but I think they are means to become agile and not just doing agile. I mean, my favorite, favorite phrase is, don't just do agile. It's about being agile. It's not about doing it, right? So you start by doing it, but the intent is to be there. And when you start early, you do an earlier opportunity, you learn from that, and then you have a propagation strategy throughout the organization. You do that, and then you have all these organization level changes which you need to make. It takes time. It's a multi-year effort. Uh, thanks, thanks, Sunil. We've uh, run out of time. Yeah. Uh, I do have a question. Yes. This is a question. Uh, can, can you keep it the last one? Yeah. You want me to ask it? Right? Yeah, yeah, you can. Okay. Uh, so, then my question is: We were discussing about uh, middle management, insecurities, and educating them about you know the role change. Uh, the question is: Who will build the cat? Is it the HR department? You know, but then again, we have to also educate them. You know, because usually in organizations, you know, there's room, you know, the elephant in the room. Yes. So who will educate them? Yeah. Well, I think it's a combination. You, you very right. I think as we say, uh, and and that's what I meant by making these organization level changes. In your HR, your you know, all of us 
supporting departments need to be start thinking in that way. If they are only concerned about you know, doing that once a year appraisal and all those policies which are very tradition oriented, then that is not going to work. And I think HR plays an important role uh, uh, you know, in, in doing that in terms of sort of being an independent party who will facilitate that. But I think the role is also of an immediate superior, right? Uh, who, who, with whom you know, this person would share a sort of a trusted relationship. And I think that person can perhaps start telling the cat, but the other senior leaders and HR can come in as enablers. But I don't think there is a set answer to this. You know, you need to look at you know, uh, you know, your organization context. But definitely, HR has a role to play in this. I think. Thanks. Thanks again. Thank you very much, folks, uh, for uh, for your for attending this session and and for making it interactive. Thanks. Thank you.